Our next speaker has been studying Nepenthes very intensively since 2004. We mainly know him, of course, of the first thing he really popped into my mind anyways was with the description of Bocorensis, Nepenthes Bocorensis, and uh, uh, the pictures he showed about it, uh, and also the habitat destruction he showed, showed a couple of months later. Um, he's here to talk about Nepenthes of Indochina. Please welcome Francois Mai. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, everyone? Well? Okay. So thanks for attending to, to this lecture. So uh, like Marcel said, I uh, got interested in carnivorous plants about six years ago. I was um, trying to grow them, and I started uh, with a Venus flytrap like most of us. And uh, quite quickly, I got interested in, in the genus Nepenthes, and I wanted to travel. First, I wanted to go to Madagascar to see the fields of Nepenthes madagascariensis. And because my family roots are in, in the China, I tried to visit that place. Uh, when, with the word in the China, you refer mainly to three or four countries. Uh, Vietnam, of course, Cambodia, Laos, and sometimes Thailand. And I um, decided to go there. I decided to, to refer to the known uh, literature on Nepenthes. And I realized that the literature was really scarce. There was not many articles and papers about that. And uh, in 2007, I, I found a plant which was not pre previously known to science, but I described last year, uh, namely Nepenthes bocorensis. And for the last couple of years, several papers have come up, come out, and uh, with a description of several species species of Nepenthes. I realized that most of the species are not very well known to the large audience, but also to, to most of the taxonomists. So the aim of this lecture today will be to explain the differences, to explain what are the new species, the differences between those species, um, most of them are quite similar, and to maybe to, to, to explain more about the botanical history, about this part of the world, and I will have a, uh, also some things to say about conservation in that part of, a, of the globe. So this is a map you may be familiar with. It was first published in uh, Stuart McPherson, uh, picture of, uh, of the old world, picture plants of the old world books. So this is the distribution, the known distribution of the genus Nepenthes in the world. Uh, some of you who, is, who are familiar with the genus know that most of uh, there are two or three centers of diversity. You have, of course, the, the islands of Borneo and Sumatra, and we lately discovered many uh, new taxa in the Philippines as well. So, uh, in the, sorry, I have to get myself familiar with that. This one, yeah. So, in the China, it's not a word that you, you're supposed to use uh, these days. It was a word used when uh, this part of the world was a French colony. The, uh, the, country, the country belonged to, uh, to the French for, for almost uh, six, 60 or 70 years. And uh, s most of the material collected in, in those three, four countries are deposited in Paris Herbarium. <coughs> so as, as you can see, um, this is more or less the northern part of the distribution. There are more or less 30 species from Borneo, Sumatra, uh, 20, 25 from Philippines, and species like Nepenthes raja, Burbice, Vilosa are well known to the hobbyists and taxonomists. But name, names like uh, Campotiana, Anamensis, uh, Torellia, of course, Geoffrey, Smilesi, may, uh, may be known for, from people, but who can really say what they are? So we tried with um, uh, uh, we have a friend, Marcello Catalano, from Italy to study uh, this genus in Indochina. And now, nowadays, today, I'm here to, to present the results of a uh, of research. So this is a map of um, Indochina. Um, this last year, this last three, four years, I spent a lot of time to, in the field in, Cam in Cambodia and in Vietnam. I was born in Vietnam more than 30 years ago in my parents move, move in France, but I was born uh, 
just, just here on the border, we had the Khmer Rouge regime who slaughtered about a third of the population, and my parents moved there. And um, so there's a few Nepenthes there. Marcello Catalano spent the last 10 years studying the species of Thailand. We know almost nothing about Laos. I did find some specimens of Nepenthes from Laos, but we don't know. There's no real botanist who study the genus in that country, and I know almost nothing about Nepenthes in Myanmar. I think the widespread Nepenthes mirabilis must occur there, but there is no official record as far as I know. So uh, you've got the Gulf of Thailand, just, just there, the Andaman Sea, it is the name along the Thailand Peninsula, and the South China Sea. Cambodia is quite a small country, and Thailand is the biggest around. So with the word Indochina, we used to refer to those three countries. Thailand was not a colony. But for purpose of convenience, when I talk about Indochina, I refer to the whole peninsula. So this is the current list of a species of Nepenthese in Indochina. I think that you know some of these species, of those names quite well. You've got species like um, Gracilis, Ampuraria, Mirabilis, and even Sanguinea. Apart from Mirabilis, you have to know that Ampularia, Guaracilis, and, Singa, and Sangu, Sanguinea are really rare in, the, in that peninsula. They only occur in Thailand. They are not known from Cambodia, Laos, on, and Vietnam. You have uh, the widespread Mirabilis that you can find in the four countries. And you have other species that occur in Thailand only or in the, the three other countries. And in the last two years, there have been quite a few species of Taxa described. You may have heard, have heard some of these names, but I think that most of the names are not familiar to, to your ears. Uh, this year, at the beginning of, of this year, Nepenthes andamana was described because uh, it, is, uh, it grows, of course, in, uh, along the coast of the Andaman Sea. You have Nepenthes Chang, which occurs in the island of Chang, Ko Chang. There's uh, a species called Nepenthes Kerai, named after botanist Care who extensively prospected and collected in uh, Thailand and surrounding countries. You have also Nepenthes serratensis from the Surat province of Thailand. You have Nepenthes Thai, recently described by uh, Martin Chick and Matthew Jeb at the beginning uh, of the year. You have Nepenthes mirabilis var globosa. That's the official name now for the plant, plant known as Viking or Nepenthes globosa in culture. Uh, Marcello Catalano decided that it's not are species, but a, a mer variety. And you have this new species, Nepenthes holdinae, that is published just now. Uh, maybe this afternoon, Stuart McPherson will bring his new books. And at the end of the second vol volume, there are four new species of Nepenthes described, one of them being a Nepenthes holdinae. It is a new species from the uh, mountains of Cambodia. So I uh, will mainly focus my lecture on the um, well, barely known species. I won't explain every, uh, something about Ampularia, Gracilis, and Mirabilis just, just, just a bit. So I hope that at the end of the lecture you will be, you will understand more of the differences between the species. If you have a question throughout the, the lecture, you just you can interrupt me. So this is the first species that I want to introduce you to. Nepenthes Thai, it was called for the country, Thailand, of course. Uh, the name was in opposition, that's why they didn't call it uh, Tayana, uh, for instance. So it's very close to another, taxonomically speaking, to another species, Nepenthes benstonii, that may some, maybe some of you have in their grow list cult in cultivation. It occurs only in Peninsula Thailand, just at the border between Thailand and uh, Peninsula Malaysia. And maybe one, last year it was introduced uh, in cultivation as a uh, Nepenthes spec Naratiwat from the Naratiwat province. So if you have some spec Naratiwat, please change your label as Nepenthes Thai. So <coughs> as you can see, it is uh, quite an inconspicuous species. I never can pronounce that word, but I think it sounds good, so I will try. Uh, 
remember, remember, remember me uh, uh, a sentence from Charles Clark when he first discovered Nepenthes, uh, when he first saw Nepenthes rhombicolis, he said that if it was the only member of a genus, it would be pretty amazing. But uh, it can be quite boring. It's got no real, nothing really extraordinary. I still think it's a nice species. The ecology is quite interesting. So as you can see, it's kind of mixed between Mirabilis and, and Gracilis. It's, uh, it's kind of rare in the nature. Uh, it's been collected a few times. Actually, when Charles Clark described Nepenthes benstonii, he studied collections of Nepenthes thai, but he decided that it was within the species uh, benstonii. But Chick and Jeb decided that it, it is a different, different species, and I will try to explain you, you why. So it's not a big species, because you can see the hand as a, as a scale. So this is the, the lower pictures. The ecology is um, um, the species occur at um, intermediate levels between, uh, you can always, you can even say lowland. Uh, it occurs on litter, mostly, sometimes in full sun, sometimes uh, in shade. You can see the habit. You have a rosette sprouting directly from, uh, from the litter. You can see the leaves. They are quite subspatulate or narrowly oblong. This is the rosette, which, is, which are quite interesting to, to my opinion. The first time I saw those rosette, I thought it was a, some kind of big Nepenthes pervillae pervile rosette. Uh, but of course, they are not uh, at all uh, closely related. So you see the shape of the leaves is quite, quite special. The species proved to be quite easy in cultivation for now. I have, I've got some specimens at home which are maybe uh, 10 or 15 centimeters large. And I, right now, I grow them in my garden, Fulsan, among my Saracenia. And of course, in October, as I live in northern France, I will bring them back in the, in the house. So uh, for each species, I, will, uh, I have wrote a sum up of the differences that it's kind of boring because it's ta taxonomical detail, but as I wanted you to know the differences between species, I wanted to, to write most of the thing. This cannot replace exhaustive description. You have to find the papers. They're, they're widely available through the net, or you can just ask me, I can send them to you. But um, so uh, Chick and Jeb, Martin Chick and Matthew Jeb decided that they, this species differ from Nepenthes benstonii, which is not a widespread species in cultivation, by the way. Sorry, uh, this one. Uh, because there are different difference in the, the hairs, the indumentum. Uh, Nepenthes stem is glabrous, there is no hair, and uh, Nepenthes uh, benstonei is hairy. In, uh, in bold, you have the pedunculus, pedunculus left, which are shorter in Nepenthes tie. The andro, andro for part of the flower is also shorter. The flower color are different, is different. Red or brown in Nepenthes tie and green in Nepenthes benstonii. And you have a color of a stem, which is black tinge in Nepenthes tie and yellow in benstonii. The leaf blaze, blades may be the more um, interesting feature to distinguish the two species. Can be shorter and narrower in Nepenthes tie, and the bases sheath the stem more completely. And the apex of the blades are usually pelted, so for rust grower, it's more easy to make the difference. And there, there is also the number of longitudinal nerves which differs. And the lower pictures are different in size. And, uh, Nepenthes uh, tie pictures, lower pictures are being smaller. But if you want my opinion, it's not easy to make a difference between the two species in the field. You, if you have some of those differences in your mind, you can do it. Or maybe you can use this one. This is quite useful. Uh, to, to, to my mind, it's. Uh, they are as closely related as uh, Nepenthes irsuta and Nepenthes ispida. It's not easy. You cannot spot the differences immediately. To, for the untra untrained eyes, it's quite difficult. I talked with Charles Clark last February. We went on a field trip together in Vietnam, and he, he doesn't agree with that. He thinks that it should be within Nepenthes benstonii, but that's just informal talk. So I don't have a special opinion about this one. I would, I would like to, to check the <coughs> both wild populations, but I never saw Benstonei in the wild, and neither did I check the Benstonei, but I'm just here to report the, the new descriptions. So the next one is um, quite famous. It's a species which has been 
introducing cultivation as Nepenthes viking or Nepenthes globosa. It has been described this year as Nepenthes mirabilis var globosa. Uh, we already have Nepenthes mirabilis var echinostoma, you know, the one with a large uh, peristome. It's known from two locations in Thailand, from the mainland city of Trong and from the island of Panga in the uh, south part of country. And the plants uh, of, uh, from the locality of Trong has been sold as Nepenthes mirabilis Trong Bizarre. Because uh, the first time, uh, I think it's Martin Schick who studied the dried specimen, he found that those mirabilis were quite bizarre. And he noted bizarre in the herbarium sheets. So the, the name just stuck. So if you have, you have some Trong Bizarre, I think that uh, Rob is having some in his playlist you should change label to Mirabilis var globosa. So for each species, I made a map so you can have a clear idea of the, of the distribution. So this is the two spots for Nepenthes globosa var globosa. This is an island, the island of Ponga, and this is a city, the city, a city of Trang. So you see it, it is really in the southern part of the country. This plant has been introduced in cultivation for five or six years now, and we've been waiting for the description for a long time. Um, when you just look at the plants in culture, you think that they are not very variable. You, you, you have the impression, the feeling, that they're all very globose, hence the name, and, are, and really reddish in pink. You have to bear in mind that the, the, um, the poacher, let's call, call them that, that way, who went in Ponga, they just chose the more roundish specimens, the most beautiful to their eyes. But when Martino Catalano went to Ponga and Trump, he realized that all globosa were not as round as the ones that you can see in cultivation. There's a bit of variation, as you can see in the following pictures. Those are, no, are not representative uh, of uh, both populations. This is a plant. Oh, sorry. If you can't hear me, just, just say it, please. Sorry. Do I have to tell everything again? Oh, that's okay. <laughs> okay. I know you, you're all sleeping, but just pretend you're interested, please. Thanks. <laughs> so this is a plant from the, uh, the trunk location, and this is a plant from the Ponga location. This, is, this population has been uh, collected and introduced in culture, but as you will see, uh, plants from both populations uh, show a bit of variation. This is other plants from trunk. You can see it can be uh, uh, yellowish, greenish with a red peristome. There is something with the, the Chinese Nepenthes is that um, most of the uh, Nepenthes growers and also the others tend to think that uh, in the Chinese species uh, all develop red peaches. That is not true. But it's just the fact that poachers collected red plants. You have green plants, uh, greenish plants, yellowish plants, som sometimes even whitish. But it's true that the reddish or low, lower peaches are quite common. You have other plants from Trang. You can see that uh, the wings um, in the lower pictures were quite developed. You can see in the same location you have differences between, between plants. So this one is, is mainly yellowish. This is other plants from, uh, from Trang also. The, the plants grow in full sun, some kind of savanna with, with grasses or sometimes uh, very small shrubs and it gets sun almost all day, all day long. And uh, the, the area where the, the habitat where the plants grow is seasonally inundated. In Asia, uh, maybe you don't know it, but uh, you have mainly two seasons, a dry season, which occurs between, uh, if my memory serves me right, between January and June, and you have um, a wet season between um, June and the, and the rest of the year. So some, some of the habitat are floated, completely floated. Yeah. And some of the species have developed some features to uh, survive to the drought. So you have other plants. The, uh, the plants on the um, on the left is also a trying plant. Plants on the right also. Uh, the reddish plants are, have been grown under the care of Marcello Catalano. Uh, they are grown under a sodium lamp, so they are not in terrarium. They grow in 40 or 50 percent humidity only. If you want to try that at home, please don't do that directly. You have to, to, get, to get the plants used to that treatment. Maybe you put that in a bag, then you open the bag slowly after a week, and, and then you, after two or three weeks, you can have a plant completely outside. And I can assure you that uh, some of the growers, like Marcello, have beautiful plants. 
and he, he doesn't need to grow them uh, in a tank like you can see in, in the picture. You have another plant from Trang, that mainland population. So this one, I think, looks a lot like the Mirabilis globosa that you can see in culture. And you have an upper picture. So this is a quite infundibula obovate. The shape is quite characteristic. This is two plants, two upper pictures from the two populations so that you can compare. They are really similar with a really developed, uh, sorry, wings here and here. The pictures can get quite big. And I, I made this uh, composition with uh, two Mirabilis. Uh, on the left, you have Mirabilis for Globosa. I don't know if you can really spot at the, what I surrounded in the circle. And on the right, you have uh, Mirabilis for Mirabilis. And as far as I know, uh, if I rely on Marcello's description and his studies and his extended field research, uh, there is no difference between the the leaves and the flowers of the two variety. Uh, the, the, the differences really dwell, dwell on the picture. That's why he chose the variety status. Uh, I asked him, why don't you make it spaces? And he, he felt and he's convinced that uh, 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 now, because of a state of taxonomy in the Pentace, it's not really clear. We don't have subspecies and only have some variety, but it would be more fitting to to keep it as a variety. So there's no real difference. You can see that uh, there are some wavy margins in the Mirabilis var globosa, but you have some Mirabilis var globosa without the wavy margins, and you have a var Mirabilis with a wavy margins as well. So I um, put two lower pictures to just to compare. To the untrained eyes, it might look like two species, but the pictures characteristic are uh, almost almost similar. I will sum up the differences between the lower pictures just after this. You have uh, an upper pictures of a Mirabilis, regular Mirabilis on the left. The upper pictures are cylindrical, tubulose, if you want. Something where there's a faint hint, hip, sorry. And the upper pictures of globos are infundibular, like the elongated shape of a wine glass. This is the habitat of our globosa. As you can see, it grows in open sun in, in just in savanna. There's, that, there's almost no, no shade. Some plants do climb on surrounding shrubs, but most of the time they're in the open like this. So to sum up the differences between both varieties. So uh, the, bit, the differences uh, are in the shape of the lower pictures there of eight globos, hence the name. And you have uh, the peristome, which is uh, a bit different, uh, which is uh, very really elongated and there is a kind of a crest here. Here, just here. And you have some differences that you can't find in globosa and that you can almost never find in Mirabilis, far Mirabilis. As you can see here, you have curling wings in the lower picture. This is not really apparent on this one but the wings most of the time are curling in this almost never appear in var mirabilis. I saw a lot of mirabilis in uh, Cambodia and Vietnam. I, I myself, I never saw curling wings in the lower pictures of var mirabilis. Uh, the tendrils and base of lower pictures are red even when pictures are still developing. And you have some green globosa, maybe you have some in your collection. And even the green globosa have red tendril and have a base of the pictures which are red as well. The picture hip uh, are absent or located in the upper half for both types of pictures. And uh, it's completely different with our variety Mirabilis. And you have a difference of the shape of the upper pictures. The glance distribution can be slightly different too. Uh, glands under the lid are nearly absent along the midline, and they're usually present in var mirabilis. But this is really detailed taxonom uh, taxonomical detail. If you want, as a mer grower, distinguish the two varieties, you just have to to get a look at uh, at the pictures. But I uh, I'm sure that if I cut the pictures of a mirabilis var globosa and a and the pictures of Mirabilis of Mirabilis, and I introduce you to both plants, you will have a hell of difficulty to say which one is what. I think you, you, you couldn't. So uh, I will introduce you now to the next species. 
This morning, uh, Alain Lurie uh, introduced us to a fascinating group of complex for Drosera. And uh, we just, with uh, the co authors of the last paper, um, define uh, an aggregate. Uh, which is a word button is used for a group of closely related species. And uh, we decided that all those species, the one in black and the one in uh, light orange, belong to the same group, like a complex if you want, but we call that an aggregate. So you have Nepenthes andamana, Bocorensis, Chang, Haldenei, the new one that you will discover in MacPherson in Stewart book. Kampotiana, which is an old name that you may be familiar with, I will really explain you what the species is. Carii, Smilesi. Smilesi is the good, the right name for anamensis. If you have anamensis, you have to change. Seratensis and Torellii. We considered that all those nine species uh, belong to the same taxonomic, taxonomical group. So what, what are the, the, the links, the common features of these species? You can see in, in black what I considered uh, as a, a common points between the different species. Most of the time they produ produce reddish lower pitches, but as I told you, that's not completely uh, true, but most of the time. They all share long racemos in fluorescence. For those in the audience not very familiar with those, that word, it means that the, the flower, the inflorescence, is long, just like a thin tube. You have no flowers uh, as a panicle. You know, uh, so all those places have a really long inflorescence. You don't, you don't have a short spike like for some species. Most of the time, they, have all, they can always, they have the ability when needed to flower at rosette stage. That means that they can flower even if they don't have the time to produce upper pictures. So that means that sometimes you have a striking sight of a rosette plants with a long spikes which is quite unusual in, uh, in the genus most of the time, maybe, I don't know, 80% or more of the time. Nepenthes need to produce upper pitches and to climb before they, they can flower. And the, the species of a, nep of a Nepenthes torellii aggregate, which is the name we use for that group of species, can flower at rosette stage. The seeds are really short. They have reduced filiform and pedages. If you have already sown the pentasids, you know that they look like small hairs. If you just, um, uh, how do you say that, sneeze? Yeah? Yeah, you, 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 they can um, fly quite easily. But the, the seed from the Nepenthes from the Torrelli aggregate are really, are really short. I will, I will show you a, a picture. The leaves are narrow most of the time. You don't have large leaves like Nepenthes regia or Nepenthes burbice, for instance. And uh, they are quite, quite f thick, coriaceous. And the leaf attachment is decurrent. If you're not familiar with that word, I will explain everything later. I'll try to, to get people to uh, have uh, interesting information for both taxonomists or hobbyists in the room. Uh, they have what we call pyrophytic habit. That means that they, can, uh, um, they are resistant to drought and to fires, just like some species of, uh, just like Roridula or Biblis. They, they do not depend on fire, but they can, they, cope. they can cope with fire. And they sometimes like the drought because it can uh, eradicate some competing plants. So we call them pyrophytes. And they produ produce a fecund rootstock. But what is really amazing in that group of plants? Uh, if, you, if some of you have a garden here, you may have already um, uh, planted dahlia, you know, the big dahlia, that you, you, big colorful flowers with roots, tubers that you keep at home in winter. Those Nepenthes species have the same kind of roots that I will show you later. In the wet season, they all look like normal Nepenthes, and in the dry season, most of them look like dead. You can, can, can all, see, all you can see is dead leaves. And, when the first downpours occur, they grow back, just uh, like they uh, regenerate, just like a bit like some tuberous drosera. And most of the time, so they produce lower pitches. So this is a typical racemose in fluorescence. This is Nepenthes smilesi. This is a really typical. See, it's very long. You have small flowers. Almost all the flowers of the aggregate of a group are one flower. You have one flower. If you're familiar with Nepenthes, you know that some species like, like Ampularia, Bical Carata, or the species of the outlying areas, you know, Madagascariensis, Pervillae, Distillatoria, Casiana, they have uh, several flowers. 
on one pedicel. Most of the time, the species of Indochina, of a, the pyrophat species, have this kind of flowers. Can you hear me? No problem? That's fine? Okay. And this is a flowering plant. So like I told you, they can flower even at the rosette stage. You don't have upper pitches yet. And this side is quite common when you go to Indochina. It's not uh, exceptional, it's not like an ecotype of something. You can see that in all the species of a, of a group. And this is quite fascinating because uh, apart from a few plants, just like the flowering campanulata that you can see in the exhibition, you're not really used to that side. You, 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 you're really used to see upper pictures with flowers. This is a short seed. This is a kind of comparison that uh, one friend of mine, an American grower, Tom Cal, made a few years ago. Uh, I, ma I made some red crosses here because at the time he didn't know the differences between the species. So what he called anamensis is in fact smilesy. So that means that those two seed pods and those two group of seeds belong to the same species. You could guess because they look identical. And this is what he thought was Torellii, and he now know that is Campuchiana crossed with Mirabilis. This is Mirabilis, this is Meridiana from Philippines, and Ventricosa from Luzon, Philippines also. And as you can see, species of a Torellii aggregate have really short seeds. Uh, if you give me, apart from maybe from a few exceptions, uh, seeds from the Torellii aggregate, I can more or less guess that it's from that part of the world. Uh, I would say that this is typical Nepenthes seed. This. You have some strange seed. Nepenthes pervillae seeds is fantastic. But this is very, really, really special. Uh, if you ask me why the seeds are short, uh, frankly, I don't know. There are some work needed to understand why. I know the season, uh, the dry season, it's really hard for those plants. Maybe the seed are let's say, device to fall in crevices and not and get some humidity from the small holes. I don't know, but that's, that's mere suppositions for me. I don't know why the seeds are short. But what I, I found is that they are short for all the species of the group. And the leaves look like this. They are kind of narrow, kind of thick in texture. This is a picture of a newly described Nepenthes holdenii. You can see the, the plants can be quite large. This um, leaves is more or less 45 centimeters. Uh, the, the, the leaf attachment is different. Um, for the layman, uh, the leaf attachment is an important, important feature to distinguish species. You have species like Maxima. They have what we call a petiole, like a short stick, if you want, uh, who, which attaches the the leaves, the lamina, lamina with the stem. With all the species of the aggregate, Nepenthes torellii aggregate, we have decurrent leaves. That means that the leaves turn into two wings running down the stem, just like this, like this as well. So if you grow Nepenthes rainwatchiana at home, you may have seen this before. It's really easy to, to see that in that uh, species. So this uh, is easy. So do not confuse with Mirabilis. Um, not so long ago, people told me, uh, or when I read old papers, uh, people told me that the Nepenthes of a Torellia aggregate look like Mirabilis. It's confusing. When you go in the field, when you have both Mirabilis and a, a pyrophyte plant in front of you, you, you cannot confuse. This is, the leaves have almost nothing in common. Mirabilis has clear petiole like this. And the leaves are soft, they are papery, just like paper. And the leaves of a species of a Torellii aggregate, they are, like I said before, the current, sacial or subpetulate, not the same at all. If you have a doubt at home, if you have a, a Mirabilis, just check this. You have a petiole and it's papery, and sometimes, but not always, uh, when the plant is young, you have a small, like small hairs on the margins of a leaf. So this is the for me, the best way to not confuse the species. Just have to look at the leaf attachment. And this is the most, maybe the most striking feature of this aggregate, this group of species, is the uh, tuber roots. As you see, they don't have normal roots. They have tubers, just like potatoes, just like the tubers of Delia. And they have kind of, kind of short, very short roots, short hairs, not many. And like I told you, in the dry season, it can be 
50 degrees of the soil can be really, really hot, and most of the plant die. They look like dead. Uh, 30 years ago, when the, the first U.S. growers uh, get their hands on some in the Chinese plants, uh, they thought the plants were dead, and almost all the growers just put their plants in the bin in the trash, they thought the plants were dead. And now we know that uh, if you don't water your plants for a long time in cultivation, the plants look like dead, but if you water it again, just come back, but don't, don't throw it away. But uh, what I saw that is in cultivation, you don't need to, to dry the soil. If you keep the soil dry for all year long, the plant continue to dry. It's not, it doesn't seem like it's, um, the dormancy is necessary, just like an adaptation to the envi environment. Uh, that's all. I have people who grow species from this aggregate, from this group for years and years and years now without any dormancy and the plants are fine. It's not like they're going to die or, or short-lived or, or something. So uh, Tom Cow, my um, American friends, sent me some pictures of a tuber roots of Nepenthes compotiana. I will explain you later what this species is. And so as you can see, it's just like a pack of um, tumbers. And what Tom usually does when he wants to divide species is that he do not take, uh, he doesn't, sorry, uh, take cuttings or divide plants. He just divide roots without uh, uh, a a a any stem here. And he put a, he just take a bunch of root. I'm just smiling a bit because I think I think he's um uh, he's uh, just like he's slaughtering the plants and he just put the, a part of the roots in pot with so, uh, wet substrate and after a while I don't know maybe after a month a few weeks you have sprouts new growth emerging from the from the root stock and you have uh, quite some new plants. So that's uh, quite interesting for horti horticulture, I think. Yeah. And those plants are really, because of a uh, habitat, they are very, really, really um, uh, toler tolerant for low humidity. I don't have the pictures here, I just forgot them at home. It's a shame, but uh, uh, I grow most of the species of the aggregate outside in summer. Um, when I have to get some pelargonium for my garden, I used to get all my Torellia aggregate species outside in the garden and I bring them back in October. I did that for two years, three years now, and they're doing just fine. I don't know if some people in the, the audience have some bocorensis, but I have a bocorensis which is 60 centimeters high and 50 centimeters large now, and I do not use or smoke out. I have nothing against it. Just to say that outside with a large pot, full sun with Saracenia just thrives completely. And uh, Tom is growing his Kampuchana also outside, and sometimes he told me that the humidity can get quite low. So it's quite interesting, I think. And the, the problem with, uh, it's uh, maybe an advantage, but it's a problem too. As you know, um, many of the plants in cultivation are, have been labeled as Kampuchana, Anamensis, Torellii, with the wrong ID. And the problem is that those plants are quite easy in cultivation. They, they have been heavily used for hybridation. So uh, the quality of the plant has become kind of a flower because now the, pl the, plant, the wrong plant with the wrong ID are really spread in cultivation. Anyway, they make good parents for hybrids or good house plants because they can cope with low humidity. Uh, so, s most of the time, the pitches, the lower pitches are, are reddish, and if you're not trying, you might find them similar, but without being insulting, because I love almost all genus of carnivorous plants. When you're not trained, you can also cannot really find differences in other groups of plants. Let's say uh, yellow tricularia or rosette rosera. I don't know. But uh, like reddish lower pictures. Maybe if you just watch details, you can see, you can say that, oh, oh sorry. Uh, oh, this one has a huge lid. Um, this one has a huge mouth. This one is like smaller. So, Anyway, I'll, try, I'll, get, I'll explain you every difference. Uh, when the plants are dried, you can also clearly spot the differences between the species. You have three species there. You have bocorensis. You can easily recognize the shape of a lid. There are many differences, but I just tell you the most obvious. So the lid is apple-shaped or orbicular with a chordate base, if you want. Um, uh, Smilesy is most of the time uh, tubulose, cylindrical with a faint hint most of the time, and the newly described holdinia is infundibular. 
Yeah? And we, we have another big differences with the other species of the aggregate is that it's two flowered in both male and female inflorescence. So this is the first species that Marcello described. He described four species in the book he published um, at the beginning of the year, Nepenthes of Thailand. He published it in Italian, but the descriptions are in English. So he named it after the Andaman Sea, and this species is endemic to the regions of the Ponga provinces. It's the same region where we could find Nepenthes globosa, Mirabilis var globosa. So this is what I call a, t a typical Torellia aggregate species. It's got nothing particular. Uh, it's uh, most of the time um, like uh, ovate here, cylindrical uh, 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 up there. It's got whitish, yellowish upper pictures. So it grows here. Here in the town of Takwapa, it's the same province that Nipentes Viking Mirabilis var globosa. And so far, uh, Marcello only found that species there. So it's an endemic. It's a lowland, lowland species. You can see the species, the lower pictures can be quite different. If you compare that with the red one with the previous pictures, it can be quite different. Sometimes the upper pictures can be striped in the, in the peristome. This is what the plants look like in the wild. It grows in savannah, uh, just like var globosa as well. And you can see standing upper pictures a bit like Nepenthes madagascariensis. And they all, uh, most of the time, they're yellowish, uh, like this. This is a kind of close-up. You see, this is a typical, sorry, this is typical leaves of in the Chinese plants. Most of the time, they look the same if you don't closely ex examine them. So Nepenthes andamana uh, has always tubular, uh, yellowish, whitish upper pictures like this. This is a rosette. It grows in sun. At home, you can, you can grow the species of this aggregate in pure sun if you want. That's how they grow in the wild, most of them. But uh, from my experience, growing them in pure sun is quite difficult in cultivation because once the sun is completely dried, it's quite hard to water it again. So I tend to mix it with uh, something else, some other compounds. So this is uh, another rosette of Nepenthes on Damana. And here, you have a picture taken at the beginning of a wet season. If you watch closely, you can see the dead vines of a dry season. You can see the climbing vines. The plants look like they're dead. And at the beginning of a wet season, when the rains come back, just like by magic, you have a new plant. So how do you make differences between this species and the other species of the aggregate? Uh, so this one, if you go to Takwapa, in the town where it occurs, you know that it's Sandamana. But if you have it uh, at home, uh, I would find that the easiest way to make the difference is to ask for location. If you don't have a location, you have to check all those boring taxonomical details. So the leaves are linear to lanceolate. Uh, you have also the indumentum, the hairs. They are caducus and they're limited to the upper part of the plants. The rosette and lower pictures always look like this, you know, kind of ovate hair cylindrical above the peristome, the mouth, if you want, is cylindrical here. And it's rarely bigger than this. I mean, it's only about one third or one uh, fourth of the length of the picture. You see, mouth is not uh, really, really big. The upper pictures, like you uh, saw before, they are tubulose or sometimes narrowly in fundibula, and they are whitish. And the, um, the peristome has according to the description, always this shape. You have a margin of a peristome which are lobed like this, just like the, the peristome didn't fold uh, completely. This is a stable feature. Uh, this is the spaces uh, I described last year that I found in 2007. Uh, it's quite, uh, so it grows in southern Cambodia in uh, Mount Bokor, the word Phnom. That uh, means hill in Cambodia. And it occurs between, 
800 and then 1,000 meters high. It's been actually it's been collected a few times in the past. The oldest uh, collected specimens were collected back in the uh, the early uh, the early um, beginning of the 20th century, uh, but people just labeled it as a Terrellia or sometimes as Distillatoria uh, from India. So uh, when I went in, in Bokor uh, three years ago, I I found that the species didn't fit with uh, what we couldn't read of a description available uh, at the time. Uh, this is the biggest species of the aggregate. The upper beaches can reach up to 35 centimeters high, so it's quite can be quite impressive. As far as I know, it's endemic to this place. Pnomboko is a huge plateau, just like a big tapir. In fact, it's 70 kilometers long, and. Uh, when you go up there, you have a great view on the Gulf of Thailand. It's kind of a touristy place, actually. Some, uh, when I searched through the internet, I found some species of pitcher plants from southern Cambodia, and they were bocorensis, but people didn't know what it was. And uh, I suspect that it might grow somewhere in the mountain range here, but there's no official record, and I found no herbarium material of this species. So. Now it's supposed to be endemic from from this uh, this mountain, so I called it after the mountain, of course. So this is some of the rosette uh, pictures, rosette pictures, and the uh, rosette plants. Uh, the habitat is quite different. It's uh, the elevation is much higher. It's almost a, a highland plant. Um, it can grow sometimes between rocks in full sun, sometimes in partial shade of surroundings, surrounding shrub and trees. What is really typical for the species is this vaulted peristome. If you have in mind Nepenthes raja, you know that the peristome is vaulted like this. You know, I, of course, it's not as impressive uh, in Nepenthes bocorensis, but it's like this. One of my friends just told me that it's like a wok, you know, for Asian cooking, uh, and it's quite characteristic of a, of a species. And here you have a nice plant with lower and. Uh, Upper pictures, you can see that the dimorphism in the species is really pronounced. No wonder that uh, one century ago they, f they thought that Nepenthes were several species. So you can see the huge, sorry, the huge uh, lead here and the yellowish uh, upper pictures. Um, see another couple of upper pictures. The peristome is often striped like this. Uh, this is quite an impressive sight. This, these upper pictures were more or less 30 centimeters long. This is, this is uh, other upper pictures. You, you can see the bit of variation. And um, almost uh, all the time, the, the peristome is large, striped, and you have a vaulted leaf like this. That's a good feature if you want to recognize uh, the species. And sometimes, from times to times, you can find a specimen like this one, which I find quite interesting, because it's almost like the, the, um, the back of the pictures is a bit vaulted. When the pictures is not really open, it look a bit like Aristolochoides, but not as spectacular, of course. So this is two plants uh, grown in different condition. The first one on the uh, left was found in full sun, completely full sun, and the other one in partial shade. As you can see, the leaves grew larger, but the picture, the upper pictures are, are still colorful. See here, yeah. yeah. This is a typical habitat of Bocorensis, so you see it's quite different of the savanna of uh, Nepenthes andamana, Nepenthes globosa, Var globosa, of course. Uh, most of the time during the day you have a lot of mist all around. The humidity is quite high in the wet season, of course. You have sphagnum. You have many uh, carnivorous plant species of, uh, I found up there, uh, Utricularia uliginosa, Bifida, Odorata, Minutissima. Uh, I also found a nice population of Drosera peltata, um, which is no wonder because uh, Nepenthes torelli, uh, torelli, uh, Nepenthes bocorensis is a pyrophyte too. It's got rootstock too. Uh, this look, looks like a wet habitat, but it is seasonally dry. Uh, completely dry, I think, for two two months because of a high elevation. Uh, one of see what my first and friends went uh, in um, March on Pnomboko, and he sent me some pictures of plants, and they were half dead, and they just come back from the dead uh, in the wet season. But most of the time, it's quite humid, and you have a lot of mist all around. So, how to recognize it from the 
all the other species of a group of the aggregate. I think the, the most, uh, the, the easiest feature is the shape of a leaf. It's got leaf larger than the other species of the uh, aggregate. And the attachment is only slightly different. As I told you before, most of the time the attachment looks like two wings running down the stem. And for Bocorensis, it's just slightly different. Like I told you before also, the lower picture and upper pictures are vaulted and the peristome is often striped. Sometimes, uh, I would say 40, 50 percent of the time, you have two flowered on the flowers, but not all the time. I examined maybe 300 specimens. I went on Bokor uh, four times, and you cannot find uh, always plants with two flowers. The pictures are more robust. Like I told you, uh, it can be up to 35 centimeters for the upper pictures. And so the, about the ecology, it's uh, more or less an intermediate plant. In cultivation, I've heard that some growers manage to grow it as a, a pure lowland plant, while other grow it as highland with quite a success. I find that my own plants grow very well at the moment now outside, because uh, during the day it's quite warm, and in the night you have a drop in the temperature, so they're really thriving right, right now. So this is Nepenthes Chang, described from, by uh, Catalano. It's endemic too, it's from the Bantad Mountains. It's uh, not far from the Cambodian border. Uh, it occurs between 300 and 600 meter above sea level. As you see, the upper pictures are quite, I would say, usual for that group of species, tubulose, yellowish, and uh, the lower pictures are most of the time yellowish and pink. I think that Martillo didn't find any real red, uh, red pictures. So it occurs in two places. The island of Ko Chang, Ko mean uh, island in, in Thai. Uh, this is quite a touristy place. And the Khao Kwap, this is quite a dangerous place. Uh, Marcello Cat Catalano couldn't go there because uh, it's heavily mined because of conflicts between Cambodian and Thai people. So Marcello couldn't find, couldn't check this location, but he uh, uh, care, uh, the botanist care went there and he collected some specimen a while ago. And Marcello find that these plants are the same and he thinks He's convinced it's a distinct species and he called it Nepenthes Chang. So it's very localized. It's not threatened in the wild, maybe in Ko Chang, but not here. You can't have access to this place. So most of the time, the lower pictures look like this. They are pinkish, orange. orange. You have the upper pictures, which are green, yellowish, sometimes really slight uh, uh, red stripes. This is a typical habitat. It's completely different from most of the other species of the aggregate. Uh, actually, the plants grow just like Nepenthes sumatrana, Nepenthes longifolia, under, under trees in partial shade. As you can see here, it grows under bamboos. So it's not at all under, under full sun. Yeah? Okay, go, cool. hurry. And uh, another, another picture here. So you can see the habitat. It grows on steep, steep ridges. So if you want to, to see the differences, um, uh, differences re uh, is, um, relies on the, the attachment, the indumentum. The lower pictures are quite small. Like this is typical Nepenthes chunk pictures. Marcello sent me loads of pictures of his species and they look more or less always the same, like this. If you want more details about the differences I can tell you later. This is a newly described species, Nepenthes holdenii. I chose to name it after the, the photographer and biologist Jeremy Holden, who studied extensively Cambodia, Sumatra, and the southeast part of Asia. Uh, this is quite a distinct species in the group. It looks superficially like Nepenthes gymnophora. It occurs in one place in the Cardamom Mountains. It's very localized. It occurs on two peaks, two peaks only. The lower pictures can be quite different. Sometimes things can be quite big. Uh, it grows in a very, very dry area. Uh, actually, it might be the species in the genus which is the more resistant to a drought because uh, where it grows, the drought uh, is extent, uh, is, uh, uh, occurs for four months, four consecutive months. And the villagers down the mountains told me that sometimes for two months they don't have a, a drop of rain. So this is some upper pictures of Nepenthes holdenii. You can see quite a variation. I have a maroon plant on the right and a pinkish 
on the left, a green one, a beautiful pink one also. This is a habitat shot of Nepenthes holdenia in the Cardamom Mountains. You can see it's really dry. It grows with uh, ant plants, plants uh, from the Ethnophytum genus and also uh, Dishigia rafflesiana. It was really a hell to climb that place. Uh, typically, the, the new leaves of Nepenthes holdenia have a different color, as you can see. Maybe if you grow Nepenthes truncata at home, you may have noticed that sometimes the new leaves are this color. It's the same thing for this species. So this is the typical habitat, steep, very steep ridges. It was really hard to take some decent pictures. You have uh, another pictures of the habitat and other pictures of a different, of a typical uh, growth. You see here the dead vines of a dry season. The species can reach up to five, six meters high and you have a new growth at the wet season. So I will just pass it. The main, the main difference is, is in the flowers. The flowers are two flowers, just like for instance, Nibetan sanguinea in Peninsula, Malaysia. But you have lots of differences. The peristome is sinuate uh, as well. And you have differences in the shape, in dimension right now. But it's quite easy to, to make the difference. This is Nepenthes Kampotiana, described from, by Lecomte a while ago. This, this name, the name is quite common in culture, but most of the time people don't know what it's like. Uh, the, it, it, is, it has been collected in the Kampot province. Unfortunately, we don't know where it was collected in Kampot because uh, uh, Geoffrey, the guy, the botanist who collected, just wrote uh, Kampot. So it's also known from Trat, Trat province. It's pear shaped, just like a small pear. It's quite easy to recognize it. It's completely glabrous. It means there is no hair on the, on the plants apart from the peaches and tendrils, which are usually hairy in the genus. So this is typical Kampotiana. The tendril are really long. You have Kampotiana with upper pictures. So you see, by looking at the leaves, it's hard to tell the differences between most of the species. But if you look at the details, that's OK. It can climb up to six, seven meters high, have yellowish upper pictures. And so the main difference is in the, the shape of the leaves, very long and completely glabrous look a bit like Nepenthes glabrata, although they are nothing in common. This is another species described by Marcello in uh, Thailand, Nepenthes carii. This is quite a sp particular species. Uh, the lower pictures are quite boring. They look like all the other species of the group. But the habitat is quite strange. Uh, we cannot see that very well. It, it, it grows in, the, in Adang. It's an it's island. And the habitat is very, very, very hot. Uh, the, it grows almost on rocks, and uh, it's very windy. Uh, I think I found that the, um, the plant react differently in cultivation. I cannot grow that plant; it's too hard. Most of my seedlings die. Uh, Marcello said that it's the same thing for him. Uh, I think if my mem memory serves me right, that Andreas Wistuba told me that um, uh, this species react differently in tissue culture than the other species of the aggregate as well. So the upper pictures are yellowish, and, and most of the time the under the lid is reddish. And the, the most, the, sorry, the easiest way to to uh, make the difference is in the shape of a of a leaf. Here you have the habitat. Here, it's what we call uh, oblong. Uh, no, not obovate. Sorry, obovate. It's like it's not narrow like the the others. This is Nepenthes smilesi. I'll make it quick, um, Marcel. Uh, this is the, the species that were, was used to be called Nepenthes anamensis after Anam, Vietnam. Uh, we realized that Nepenthes smilesi described in uh, 1895 and Nepenthes anamensis described in 1908 were the same plants. So because of uh, rules of priority, uh, now we have to call it Nepenthes smilesi. That's a good name. It's been described before. It is, it is really widespread. It is very adaptable species. It can grow at sea level. I found it in Cambodia in sea level. And you can find it in Dalat in Vietnam in 1,500 meters. So it's a highland plant. But most of the time, you find it at 600 or 800 meters high. 
It's a real pyrophat. Most of the time, the areas where it grow um, are burn. Uh, it's not very clear here, but you can find some trace of charcoal on the pictures. The area has been burned recently. Sometimes pictures are the peristom are raised like this, but it's not a regular feature. Plants like this have been collected and have been introduced as Torellii as cultivation because they were beautiful in red. And this is habitat of smileys in Cambodia and in Cambodia too, in a 600 meters high. It grows with pine in pine forest, just like in Thailand. So I just pass this, this thing. Uh, this is one of the two last species that I want to introduce you to, Nepenthes suratensis. The easiest way to recognize it is the shape, the triangular shape of the mouth and the size. Most of, uh, all, uh, all of the time, the mouth is one third or one half of a pitcher length. It occurs in a Surat, where is it? Suratani province here. You see the size of the mouth? I think it's quite clear. If you have a tiger, Dimpetes tiger or Torellii from Surat province, it's Suratensis. And of course, you have some other taxonomical detail. But if you're really interested, I think you will find the description. If not, the size of the mouth will be enough. So you, you see all the pictures are not red have some kind of difference too. The upper pictures are, don't have anything in, part, in special. Suratensis habitat here. And here, Marcello collected several lower pictures. So you can see that it's constant. The mouth is different plants, of course. The mouth is triangular. It's got big size in proportion of a lower picture. So this is the species, and I will end with this, which is the most uh, known in culture, Nympentes terrellii. It's been a source of confusion for hobbyists, horticulturists, and taxonomists, of course, for all the 10th to 12th century. These pictures are quite boring. These are the types, the dried specimen. When you describe your plants, you must have now uh, a type. They dwell in Paris. There are several types. They were collected uh, 1,050 years ago. It has been collected here. And I have added a point here because it may grow there. It has been collected by Dr. Clovis Torel. It was a French medic. He, he went uh, to, uh, in Cochinchina. It was the old name for Vietnam. And uh, he was um, a real fanatic of plants. And uh, between 1862 and 1866, he extensively collected many plants as he could during his free time. Here you have an illustration of him collecting epiphytic orchids. I, but that some of you crazy guys have already been in trees. If you didn't, you don't know what real life is. Uh, and he, he wanted to, 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 to write the flora of Vietnam, but he didn't have enough money. He wanted to do that with uh, Dr. Pierre, you, you might know. And, uh, but he didn't have enough money, so he returned to Paris. And a few years before he died, he gave all his 500 material uh, Voucher specimens to Paris Herbarium. Uh, uh, and 50, uh, there, Paul Henri Lecon, one of the French botanists, described Nepenthes terrellii. Unfortunately, by studying the specimen, I realized that Paul Henri Lecon didn't select any type because at the time it was not necessary. So he just, he just had some terrellia, terrellia dried material in front of him and he made a description. Unfortunately, I, I checked all the material and I realized that he described it with three different species. It's like you have, Dro um, I don't know, Drosera Aliciae, Drosera, uh, let's say, Trinavia, Drosera, uh, another one, uh, Rosette of Cystiflora, and you make one description. So you, you describe a kind of chimera monster. So it, so because it was, there was no type. But fortunately, in 1997, uh, sorry, uh, Jabenshik, chose a, le a type, they elect or typified, and they chose a good plan. So Torellii is a plant that will match that type. If you find a plant which is the same, but this one chosen by Jabenchik, it's Torellii. And in the course of the 20th century, most of the people just said, uh, we don't understand. Mo most of the people, most of the plants called Campotiana, Anamensis, or Torellii, they, they're similar, but they're different. They're sometimes completely round, they're elongated, they have large leaves, narrow leaves, it doesn't make much sense. So uh, 
I will make this really short. Most all the plants that you have in cultivation under the name Torelli or not Torelli, they are either uh, Campuchiana, Smilesia, Bocorensis. Why? Because those species, those three species, were the most easy to find in the wild. So Torellia is one of these species. If you want. If you want to have a whole story, when Stewart will bring his book uh, in the appendix, I wrote a really long paper on the story of that species. It's, uh, it's really, really boring, something like uh, 20 pages long, but you, ha you will know everything in detail. So, and I find, uh, this is for, for Jan, I found some more types in Paris which fit the description of Torelli. So thanks to that, I, can, I made an amended description. So you can see the pictures are quite different. And thanks to all those types, um, I made a drawing. So if you go to holidays in Vietnam and you find a plants like this, really globos like Viking, but with uh, this kind of lease, with a kind of attachment, and upper pictures like a bit of elongated Aristolochoides, then you have to phone me because it's Torellii. And in November 2009, uh, some Vietnamese kids posted pictures of, uh, I'm not allowed to show you that, but Let's forget it. Uh, they posted some pictures on the internet, and when I saw that, my heart just jumped. I said, that fits the Torellii material that I saw in Paris. Uh, you have a globose pictures, and you have a pyrophyte leaves. This, to my opinion, this fits with Torellii, but I wanted to behave like a scientist, but I'm not, but I wanted to go there uh, to compare the population with a dried specimen to make sure that we can say that Torellii is re rediscovered. You see? I don't know if maybe I, c I could understand that they all look the same for you, but it's really different. They're really globose and the leaves are completely different. This is the habitat. We went there with Dr. Charles Clark. There was a lot of Mirabilis, Drosera indica, reddish one, uh, a lot of Utricularia, but we found no Torellii. And the reason was, uh, according to the villager, is that the kids um, poached all the plants. So I was quite angry because it was the only known population of the plants which could be Torellii. So this is all the plants that I showed you. You have a by alphabetical order of nine species with lower pictures and upper pictures. Uh, they are similar, but then you cannot say that it's the same species. Uh, they are variable. They are more or less look the same, but uh, you can have uh, you can make differences. I published a key in the paper if you're interested. So this is the map with a distribution with all the species. Uh, I won't pretend that it's a complete. We have to check Bur uh, Laos, Myanmar. Uh, Vietnam has not been really prospected either. So some, most of the species are really localized and threatened in the wild. Here, you, here uh, this is the location of Titin in Vietnam, where Torelli has been collected. It, it was supposed to be filled with swamps. All of the Torelli sheets uh, indicated swamps, swamps of Titin, swamps of Ongiem. And now it's just paddy fields or uh, rubber plantations, just like this. I couldn't find any Nepenthes terrelii out there. There's nothing left to see. And people told me we didn't see any Nap Am, any pitcher plants in Vietnamese, for 30 years now. And I found some Mirabilis uh, with a, an old Vietnamese uh, woman, woman, and he said, I'm surprised because I didn't find any pitcher plants since I was a kid here. I didn't think that they were still growing in my hometown. But of course, no terrelii. So, uh, they are threatened by urbanization, by agriculture, and also by traditional medicine. So all these rubber plantations now. And the five, six last pictures, you have a trunk population of Nepenthes Mirabilis Varglobosa. It's been destroyed just recently because they just built a road up there. So the Mirabilis Globosa from Trang almost disappeared. So you have them in culture, fortunately. And the last location is in Phnom Boko that I first visited in 2007. It was quite a nice place, touristy. You could uh, climb you know, on a moto. It was a kind of a nice trip. And now it's just been turned out because they built a casino resort, a landing area for helicopters. So they destroyed most of the plants. And we are just interested in carnivorous plants, but there are many endemics, uh, uh, lizards, snakes, insects, and some small mammals, of course. So this is the Boko uh, area, and this is the plan for a great temporary master building project. 
So what I suggest in my humble way, uh, like Alan said this morning, I don't think we can say, we, there's nothing we can really do ex situ right now. The government of Indochina, they don't care about the plans. They've got national parks, but it's just a big joke, if you want my opinion. Uh, the Boko National Park is a national park, and they build a casino out there. Out there. So I think that we must um, keep the diversity of the species which are threatened, especially the lowland species, Andamana, Suratensis, Varglobosa, and we have to introduce planning cultivation, of course, with authorization, and I think that it's the responsibility of a nurseryman, of an articulturist, nurseryman and woman, to uh, correctly label the plants and clones identify, number, and propagate it. I think that all we can really do now is the in-situ program, maybe in a few years, we can set new plans in the wild, but uh, that's what we can do now. So thank you, and I'd like to acknowledge some of my friends who helped me for all my work. <laughs>